Welcome to Convince Me in 15 Minutes, where we give our guests 15 minutes to convince us about timely topics in the financial services industry. Before we begin, please subscribe below. The Convince Me in 15 Minutes podcast will introduce you to new concepts, theories, philosophies, and practices in the financial services industry. Your guides are Luke Tewiz and Keith Thompson. We'll follow up the initial presentation with questions. So again, subscribe below and we'll introduce our guest speaker. Hi, my name is Adam Rosenzweig. I'm a managing partner and one of the two founders of Gehring & Rosenzweig. We're a natural resource investment firm dedicated to the space. And we try to be as original and as thought provoking with our investment themes and our research as we possibly can be. And today I'm here to talk to you about why I think that uranium and nuclear energy has an unbelievably bright future and probably a huge investment bull market out in front of it. And it's a bit of a departure for us because a lot of times we like to be contrarian. And right now, as we're writing or as we're talking to you, uranium prices are $106 a pound. And that's up from a high of $18 a pound a couple of years ago. And that's when we got excited. And that's when we got involved. And the reason which I'll talk about today is still in effect today, and I think it's going to continue to be um, for the next five, six, maybe even seven years, eventually, the bull market will probably come to an end, just like every cyclical commodity bull market does. But in the case of uranium, I think it's a little bit different. And I think it's a little bit unique because the supply demand dynamics are really different. So let, let me tell you about why. Um, you can make the case, looking back, since we first split the atom uh, back at um, the Manhattan Project in the US in World War II, that the world has been in a uranium surplus. And that is no longer true today for the first time really in history. So why do I say that? Well, right after the Manhattan Project, we started to make nuclear power plants. And they started to proliferate throughout the world in the 1960s. And in fact, there was a huge amount of excitement that nuclear power was going to really be the future of all electricity. It was extremely efficient. People didn't really care about CO2 as much back then. But it was really the efficiency of uranium and nuclear power that had people so excited. It was going to generate electricity that was so cheap that it would be too expensive and bothersome to even bother metering it, kind of the way we handle water today. And so we would basically just you know, pay your utility couple bucks a year and have unlimited electricity all generated from nuclear power plants. And yet, despite all of that proliferation of the reactors, we still managed to produce more uranium than we ever consumed in any given year. And so you had just an abundance of uranium throughout the 1960s and 1970s. And a lot of that went into government stockpiles. All the governments around the world bought up as much as they could to try to keep other governments from buying uranium to try to build weapons. And so by the early 1980s, uh, the Soviets and the Russia and the Americans had so much uranium on hand, and particularly in the case of the Soviets, they were you know facing obviously a lot of financial and economic pressure. And they said, "Look, why don't we reclassify all of this material from government stockpile to commercial stockpile? We'll make it available to the nuclear reactors that can actually use it instead of just stockpiling it or making more and more and more weapons with it." And so they agreed to do that. They even agreed to downblend some of their weapons grade uranium and plutonium back into fuel grade uranium. And because of that, starting in the early 1980s, prices collapsed. You know, we basically we're able to reduce mine supply of uranium by 50% and keep the market balanced by using all these government stockpiles. But the government stockpiles were huge, but they weren't infinite, and they ran out. And they finally ran out in 2005, 2006. And that's when uranium prices went from $9 to $150, like that, almost overnight. And the GFC, the global financial crisis, happened. They pulled back a little bit. And then they started to rise again. And then Fukushima happened in 2011. We shut off 30% of the world's reactor demand. And so because of that, we obviously were producing way too much uranium since 30% of the reactors were now shut down. And all of that excess uranium made its way, not into government stockpiles this time, but into commercial stockpiles. And that happened all the way to 2018, 2019. And by 2019, the big uranium producers, prices had fallen 90% from 150 back down to 19 bucks. Uh, even the biggest producers in the world, Cameco in Canada and Kazataprom in Kazakhstan, couldn't make money mining uranium at such low prices, and they shut their mines. And so in 2018, we actually had reactor demand above primary mine supply for the first time in quite some time. Uh, and we started to dwindle those commercial stockpiles that had built post-Fukushima. 
And then last year, and you could have done this on the back of an envelope. It's what we did. That's how we made our investment. But last year, it became really clear to us that those commercial stockpiles were finally about to be exhausted. So for the first time, like I said, for the first time since we split the atom, we now have a massive primary deficit, meaning total reactor demand is way above mine supply. And we have no commercial stockpiles to help bridge us. And that's where we are today. So prices have run from 19 to 106. And I think they're going a lot higher. And part of the reason I think that is that every commodity bull market is going to be undone by something. And it's usually either going to be undone by demand destruction or new supply coming online. In the case of uranium, I think it's going to be new supply coming online. And the reason is that you almost can't have demand destruction because if you have a multi-billion dollar nuclear power plant that's up and running, you will pay anything for the nuclear fuel. The total cost of your nuclear fuel is only a few percentage points of the total cost to operate that, that facility, particularly once it's already been built and it's sitting there ready to go. So you know, if you have a facility, particularly a newer facility that's now spinning and, and generating uh, electricity, what would you pay? Would you pay 200, 300, 400? You could pay $500 a pound and run that through your model and you would still choose to fuel that reactor and keep it open. It's very costly to finally decommission a plant as well. And you can't kind of shuttle them back on and off and on and off. So the buyers are going to pay almost anything to get the fuel. And the mine supply, you're at the right price now to incentivize new mine supply coming online. However, is it going to come on this year? No. Is it going to come on next year? No. Uh, I think that you have a multi-year run here where prices are going to potentially spike to the upside. So fundamentally, maybe we're at a nice price now for a really long-term equilibrium, but we're going to really overshoot that mark to the upside in the next couple of years because we've starved the industry for capital for a really long time and because demand is so inelastic and because it's going to take supply a few years to respond. So that's why I think everyone should be involved in some capacity uh, in the upcoming uranium upcoming or ongoing uranium bull market. Now it's had a big run. And so every time something has a run, it has the chance that it could pull back. So if you're a trader type, maybe you wait for a pullback. If you're a long-term investor, maybe just hold your nose and buy it now because it has run a little bit, but we're fully uh, invested in our uranium thesis. It's a core position for us. It continues to be. Um, and, and I think that this market is just getting started and has the chance to really get chaotic and out of hand. So that's my, 15 minutes. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, quick question for you, though. You mentioned two potential reasons for demand destruction. What we saw with Fukushima wasn't either of those. That was kind of a, a black swan event. What, what keeps something like that from happening again, uh, you know, an event at a, a nuclear power plant that makes people rethink, you know, should we be doing this? Well, I suppose nothing, but it, the statistics are sort of on your side, right? In the sense that when you look on a global basis, nuclear power, nuclear reactors are far and away the least incident prone out of anything and, and by a wide, wide margin. So if you look at, you know, fatality rates per megawatt hour dispatched, if you look at, I think 550 people get killed at, at coal train crossings every year. And, you know, the total death toll, there, there's been three incidences uh, throughout history so we've been producing electricity from nuclear reactors at scale since the 1960s or 1970s, depending on where you determine scale to be. And there's been three incidences. The first was Three Mile Island, where nothing happened. Everything was fine. You had no breach of the containment vessel. Close call, but nothing happened. You had Fukushima, where despite all of the uh, news hysteria at the time. Nobody actually died in Fukushima at the nuclear reactor. I remember very vividly watching those people go in to turn off valves and things like that. And, and it was sort of like viewed as this uh, suicide mission to save humanity. Um, I think the first one of those gentlemen passed away this past year, which, you know, the actuarial tables would say that, you know, over a 12 year period, if you have a group of 40 something men, that one of them has, has a likelihood of, of, of dying and the 15 years, but there's been no excess mortality from those people. And certainly no one died immediately at the time. And then of course you have Chernobyl and Chernobyl was a weapons program uh, by the Soviet Union. There was no containment vessel. So there's absolutely no e even pretense of safety uh, at Chernobyl. Um, so could you have another Chernobyl? I mean, I, I don't, I don't think that we have any nuclear 
power reactors operating with the lax level of security and uh, oversight that you did back then. Uh, and so that kind of leaves, you know, two events in 50 years, um, neither of which were particularly harmful. So could it happen? Yeah, it absolutely could happen. Black Swan events are notoriously difficult to predict. I think that's why they, I think that's kind of the point. But, um, you know, you just have to be cognizant of it. You have to be cautious. I think that, you know, it's something to watch, but we frankly can't afford to ignore nuclear anymore because we're now very worried about carbon in the atmosphere. And if you want to decarbonize, you have two options. You can either go wind and solar, or you can go nuclear. And unfortunately, wind and solar are just not up to the task, given their really poor energy efficiencies and energetics. So it's going to have to be nuclear. And I don't think we can kind of afford um, to ignore it the same ways we have in the past. Where in the world are most of the new projects taking place? Is it China and India building new reactors? So presently, it's China and India. Um, there's a few other countries uh, as well. There's some Gulf state countries as well. Um, but China's, China's really the big one, uh, and India's coming along behind. Um, that's where most of the demand is coming from between now and 2030. Now, I should point out, there's actually been another source of demand. It's not necessarily demand growth, but it's higher than expectations had been. And that's from Western countries you know, throughout Europe and the United States and Canada, who have chosen to extend the life of several of their reactors. So there had been a view you know, not many years ago that um, Europe, for instance, was going to completely decommission its nuclear power fleet. Germany basically went down that path. France had yet to do it. Belgium had yet to do it. UK had yet to do it. Uh, and those have all been given, you know, proverbial second leases on life with their uh, permits having been extended. So, so that's new uranium demand that really wasn't in people's models. It's not new reactor growth. It's just a slower pace of retirement than had been expected. China is responsible for the most by far gross new builds. Uh, the Koreans are actually pursuing a nuclear program as well. And then, as you mentioned, India, Saudi Arabia is contemplating it and several other Gulf Arab states are as well. Um, post 2030, and it's, it's really interesting because if you keep uranium prices where they are today, by 2030, we'll, we'll have brought on new mine supply. There's no two ways about it. Uh, Arrow and Wheeler River coming online in Canada, and there'll be others around the world as well. But by 2030, then you start to talk about this quote unquote nuclear renaissance that people are hopeful for in the United States at present and, and the small modular reactors, which means today a typical reactor is about 1200 megawatts. The new small modular reactors are much smaller. They tend to run anywhere for as low as 50 megawatts to as high as 300 megawatts. So they're not the kind of huge nuclear plants that you might have expected in past generations. They're more, um, you know, smaller sized. The smaller size allows them to be fabricated in a factory, which should help keep costs down. You know, these massive, massive gigawatt plus projects tend to be these bespoke designs done kind of on premise. These can be done in a, in a fab facility. And then most importantly, some of the new small modular reactor technology, not all of it, it is fundamentally different. You know, this is these are new reactor designs, the first major new reactor designs in 40 and 50 years. And in a lot of cases, like particularly when they call them the, the molten salt reactors or the MSRs, um, what they're trying to pursue is technology that's been around since the 1960s, but the Navy preferred to go in a different direction. And then the civilian power nuclear power industry decided to follow the lead of the Navy. So these are designs that have been around a long time and everyone appreciates their benefits, but we just haven't gone down this path before. And so if those could happen, they could be much more cost effective, much more energy effective, and, and could you know really begin to quickly add huge amounts of uranium demand in the 2030s. So it's not for us a right now story. It's something we're monitoring very, very closely. Supply is not a right now story either. You can't ramp it up that quick. So it'll be interesting to see how new mines are offset with these small modular reactors. But again, that's a 2030 story. And here in the United States, I think we've only built one in the last maybe even 20 years or five years. Am I correct in that? Yeah, we built Vogel in, in South Carolina. And it was a huge, huge disaster in terms of cost overruns and delays. Uh, and part of the reason for that was Fukushima. And so we tightened a lot of standards halfway through that build. And so we ended up basically having to scrap it almost halfway through and start again from the beginning. The second thing is that at that point, like you mentioned, it was the only one. So we basically had taken our nuclear uh, engineering and nuclear construction 
uh, abilities and, and, um, and, and expertise almost to zero. And so that was the big, you know, kind of albatross in the industry. It had a huge cost blow up. It ended up actually bankrupting Westinghouse, who had a, you know, EPC or engineering procurement contract that was, they were responsible for the overruns. The overruns ran into the tens of billions. They ended up declaring bankruptcy over it. I mean, it, it was an unmitigated financial calamity. Um, and, and that's been the only one. Hopefully when we rebuild our industry, we can, we can start to get that back down. The big bottleneck right now has been on welders and on cement pourers of all things. So, you know, it's not, it's not the engineers, it's not the, you know, super sophisticated nuclear scientists. It's on the people who can weld to such a high specification that they would be able to, you know, pass certification. I should point out that all of these small modular reactors or not all of them, but the ones that I mentioned, uh, wouldn't actually require any of the super skilled welding or cement pouring that the current generation requires because there's no pressure in them. Today's nuclear reactors are basically a uh, system where you have a nuclear fuel core and you put it in a pool of water and that core generates heat and it generates heat at about 400 degrees Celsius. Of course, mm -hmm. water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. So you need to do two things to keep the water from all boiling away and allowing your fuel rods to get overheated and eventually melt down the containment vessel. The first thing you have to do is keep the water under pressure, just like the radiator in your car. If you keep the pressures really high, you can actually have water that's greater than 100 degrees Celsius and doesn't boil. The second thing is you have to keep pumping it and pumping it and pumping it. So how do you do that? Well, you need these massive, massive pumps, super fault resistant and, and fault tolerant. You need these really, really thick pipes because you're dealing with couple hundred atmospheres of pressure where they join together. You need incredibly high specification weld joints, right? To make sure that you don't blow one of those out and release radioactive steam into the containment vessel. And then because of all those big steam requirement, uh, steel requirements, you need a huge foundation to rest the whole thing on. Um, molten salt changes out the water for salt, which actually melts from a solid into a liquid at about 200 degrees C. And it only boils from a liquid to a steam at like 900. Don't quote me on those numbers, but that's basically the range, right? So that you can actually take all the heat out of the core without ever risk of boiling the salt. And so you don't have any pressures at all. And lo and behold, you have no steel. And when you have no steel, you have no cement or very little. So it's a much better technology. It's much more fit, built for purpose. And, you know, I think we should see really great things. But I should point out, you know, the Chinese and the Koreans can bring these third generation reactors, the ones that we have now, they can bring those on, on time and on budget. So it seems to be a uniquely Western thing that we've lost our ability to do this. You talked a little bit about the, the demand pull side. That's, that seems to be obvious, but to talk a little bit about the supply side, how many potential suppliers are there? You talked about how long it takes to ramp that up. Why, why so long? Well, I think, frankly, most mining operations in the world today take a long time to ramp up. You know, you, between the permitting the uh, engineering, the delineation of the resource, and then the ultimate construction and production of both the mill and the uh, the mine and the mill, they're not things that can turn on overnight. Um, so where, where do we produce uranium today? Well, we had such a bad bear market really since 1983, if you think about it, with a little reprieve in the early 2000s, but it's basically been you know a nearly 40-year bear market um, that you whittled the industry down almost to two uh, primary uranium producers. The first is Cameco, which used to be the state-owned company in Canada and Saskatchewan. Now it's a private company. It's listed on the stock exchange. And Kazataprom, which is the partially privatized Kazakh uranium producing company, also quoted in London um, as an ADR. So those are the kind of pure plays that are producing sizable volumes today. I don't have an exact number, but they make up, you know, the majority of primary uranium production in the world. Certainly, I don't know how exactly what it is, but pretty, I don't want to say all, pretty close to all. Olympic Dam, which is owned by BHP, produces uranium as a byproduct and maybe it produces a little bit as well. Um, right now, as far as new projects coming online, the US used to produce half the world's uranium. However, like I said before, when the government started reclassifying all of their stockpiles as commercial stockpiles and prices fell. The U.S. was more of the expensive production. It went away completely. The U.S. produces basically no 
primary uranium today. That's in the process of changing now. They have existing mines or existing operations. They're not actually mines. They're what are known as in situ leach, meaning you drill a well, you pump a solution, and you actually dissolve the uranium from the rock into the well bore, and you pump it back up to surface, and you uh, and, and you retrieve it. Um, those are quicker to come online. They're fully permitted. They're ready to go. And we're actually expecting to see some new production come from those mines or those facilities this year in 2024. Now. It's not going to be enough to really loosen the market. And long term, it's not your most economic source of supply, but it can be brought online quickly. And I do think that there's quite a strong demand right now for domestically sourced uranium. I think there's a feeling that too much of our supply comes from Kazakhstan and too much even our Canadian supply gets processed in Russia. So there's a huge push to try to make a bit of a security of supply either in the U.S. or with what they call, you know, friendly nations. So I think that those will go. Um, they're not going to be enough to move the needle, though. Then the big wild card is Kazakhstan. And they were the big kind of surprise post Fukushima. Following the price spike five years earlier, they decided to commit to all kinds of new operations. They're also in situ leach. Um, they ramped up in 2012, 13, 14, just at the wrong time, right as we closed all these nuclear reactors, they brought all these new facilities online. They were one of the reasons that prices fell so much. They claim to be able to increase production like another 50% in the next two years. And we've been really skeptical of that, um, of that claim. And just last week, they've now announced that not only can they not grow 50% in the next two years, but their production is actually going to be down. Uh, so that was a huge um, shock to the market. That was one of the reasons last week that uranium prices moved a lot higher. Even Kazataprom, moved higher, the stock, even though they announced that they wouldn't produce nearly as much as they thought, but the uranium price went up enough on the back of that. So that's that's how tight this market is, right? Is that people are starting to get really, really, um, really, really bold up about it. Uh, and then you have some primary mines coming online in Canada. You have NextGen, which has the Air, uh, which has the Aero project, and you have um, Denison, which has the Wheeler River project. Those are good mines, uh, both of them will make a big contribution to new incremental mine supply. But I just don't see how they're going to come online before 2028 is like 2028 is what the companies are saying. It's going to be 2030 when it's all said and done. So that that's kind of what we're looking for. We're looking for whether or not a lot of new money is flowing into the industry, whether a lot of new supply is going to come online. Eventually it will. And I think it'll come from those two areas, uh, but it's not for a few years yet. And we own pretty much all the names that I just mentioned. I was going to say, you've only mentioned you know, what, three or four names. That's not a, most portfolios aren't built around three or four names. Um, what other ways are there to invest in this space? So uranium, we should point out, we're natural resource investors. So we're thematically driven. When we like a theme, we'll invest a portion of the portfolio in the theme. And we like uranium. So we have 25% of the portfolio in uranium, uranium stocks. Um, those were some of the ones that we just mentioned, you know, Kazataprom and Cameco, um, some of the U.S. guys, which are easy enough to find if you go and, and look online. Um, and then NextGen and, and Denison are two Canadian projects that I think are the highest quality upcoming development stories. Back in 2018 and yeah, 2018, when we established all of our positions, Cameco announced that they would be shutting their two flagship mines. They said, look, I can, we have long-term contracts at like 30, 35 bucks. I don't think they announced what the prices were, but you could kind of impute what they were through their, through their numbers. Um, yeah, higher than, than spot spot was 18. The cost to take uranium out of the ground was 25 kind of making these numbers up, but the, that was, that was the range. So they said, look, we can actually go and buy spot material for cheaper than we can dig a pound of uranium out of the ground. So we might as well leave our asset for the future go and buy spot material, sell the spot material into our long-term contract book and make a margin on it. And in fact, the lower, ironically, the lower uranium prices go, the more money they would make at that point. The company was trading at 75 cents on the dollar of book value with $500 million of net cash on the balance sheet. You know, it, it was one of the easier investment decisions we've, we've had, right? And, and, the, and if prices go up, they'll do well. And if prices go down, they'll make more money because the spread will widen. So they decided to shut their minds and do that. And at the time, they had about 70 million pounds, if I'm not mistaken. It might have been less. I don't I have to go back and look at the number. But they had a, a decent 
inventory uh, of uranium that they held on their balance sheet every year. And the reason was, right, there's so few uranium producers out there at the end of that bull mar a bear market. And it's so mission critical for these reactors, for their clients and customers to have fuel that they felt it prudent to hold an inventory in case their mine went down, in case they had a flood in one of their mines and it was shut for six months. They couldn't let that devastate the global uranium uh, nuclear power business. So they kept an inventory and they announced when they decided to shut their mines, they said, look, it's not our intention to whittle down our inventory. We want to go out and source spot material and sell that into our long-term contract book. We have no intention of taking down our inventories. Fine. Sure enough, you look at them three years later, their inventories were down by 75%. They could not source that spot material. And that was a really good indication that there wasn't as much easily mobilized commercial overhang following post Fukushima as we would have expected. The second is now watching the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust and watching what they do when they raise new money and they have cash to deploy, seeing how long it takes them to put that to work. There's no material available. And so you can see them holding way more cash than they want to. They want to put that money to work. They don't want to hold cash. It creates a tracking error. It leaves their clients frustrated or their investors frustrated. So they want to put it to work, but they're having a real hard time. And part of the reason for that, you know, I told you that Kazakhstan had announced that they would have this big production increase next year. And now, in fact, not only are they not going to have that, but it's actually going to fall. All of that material was spoken for. It was all contracted. That was all expected by the fuel fabricators, by the enrichment companies, and by the ultimate reactor end users in China. So the market is now physically short into 2025. Like there are active Chinese nuclear reactors that just don't won't be getting the fuel that they expected and they're scrambling and they need to be sourcing that material right now in order to make it into fuel rods in time. So we have heard anecdotally that, that the Chinese utility buyers are freaking out and they're in the market buying spot material at any price. And that's, what's kind of leading to this parabolic blow off in some of the, in some of the uranium prices. So, you know, that it, it's a really tight market. And I think what people don't understand, what's a little bit unique about the uranium bull market today is that people say, well, how much new demand has to come online to really get this market tight? I said, no, guys, it's been tight. It's been tight for five years, but you've had this one time overhang of inventories, right? It was a big number, like 500 million pounds of excess inventories that were just sitting on top of the market. And you, it just took time to absorb them. So we got involved when we started to see the primary deficit come out, meaning Every year, the inventories were coming down. Every year, demand was more than supply. Every year, we were in deficit. But it's not a crisis until you actually whittle down that cushion. Now you've whittled down the cushion, and now you're starting to see the reaction. I think I could uh, probably ask you another dozen questions or so, but I want to be respectful of your time. Um, do you have any final comments you want to make or any final last uh, thesis you want to support? No, listen, you know, I think we had a really good discussion. Always happy to come and do this again if we want to focus on something else. But I think in the meantime, you know, the, these industries are cyclical. And the reason they're cyclical is mostly because of the capital cycle. It's, it's the mistiming of when money comes in. And so, you know, commodities do well. They earn really, really super normal profits. Um, word goes out that you have to own, you know, oil. You have to own steel, you have to own gold, cocktail parties are dominated by new oil discoveries or talks of Krugerrands and stuff like that, or maple leaves, whatever the gold coin of the day is. And then they go through periods of time where well, because of that and all that money gets spent, new supply comes online. Murphy's law usually means that it comes online at just the wrong time. Prices collapse and everyone says, oh my God, you know, the oil industry is just full of wildcatters and irresponsible, you know, stock promoters and gold mining is nothing more than a liar standing over a hole in the ground. And of course, like neither of those extremes are true. The truth is somewhere in the middle and you should probably own this stuff kind of forever as a, you know, general diversifier because it's very different than your other investments. If you're not going to do that, you should probably make sure you stay away when they're really popular. And if you can stomach the idea of getting involved when they're super unpopular, you'll probably do okay, uh, if not very, very well. And I think they're as unpopular now as they've ever been. Um, you know, go, go 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 to a go to a conference like we, we always joke. You know, if you go to Iris Zone and you pitch a fertilizer company, people would like really look at you like you had three heads. But there'll be a time where where 
you know, the fertilizer stocks used to be a huge hedge fund play. Just look at the uranium stocks. Like three years ago, we used to tell people we loved uranium and they were like, what are you talking about? And now it's like the hedge fund darling. So these things change very quickly and you should probably get some exposure, you know, while they're cheap. Well, I can't thank you enough, Adam, for your time. Um, do you want to just quickly share with us if somebody wanted to find out more information about your company, where they should go? Yeah, our website is Go Rosen, G O R O Z E N, and we are Gehring and Rosen Swag. And if you type that even a little bit right, you'll Google point in the right direction. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Adam. Appreciate your time. Keith, do you want to say anything else? No, I just want to say thank you. Have a wonderful day. And uh, we would actually love to have you back on again to maybe talk about some of these other issues because, uh, like I said, I think there's a, as much as there's a demand for uranium right now, I think there's a demand for information about things like this. So uh, it's great to have somebody like you on to, to share your expertise. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Happy to help and happy to be on another time. So let me know.